In talking to both adults and young people these days, I find that most people don't seem to realize that we're living in an amazing time in human history, a great age of discovery about the origins, evolution, and extent of the universe, and about the physics that animate it. That's why the library wanted to bring you this event tonight. In the last 100 years, we've learned more about the cosmos than was known in all of previous human history. These discoveries have given us new understanding of space and time. They have had an impact on our sense of who we are and what our place and destiny in the universe might be. The James Webb Space Telescope will allow us to write yet another chapter in that story, enabling us to see back through time 13 and a half billion years to the period of the formation of the first stars and galaxies in the universe. And I still can't believe that. Pretty amazing. Uh, we may be at times disappointed, even cynical, about our species, but this quest for understanding and knowledge about our world is our glory, and you're going to get a chance to revel in that tonight. You are not only living at a special time regarding the discovery of the cosmos, but you are living in a special place. Many of the great discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics have been made right here in your own backyard. JPL, which has managed many of these, so the space probes that have explored our solar system and beyond, is located in nearby Pasadena. I live in Pasadena, and very often when I drive to work, I look up at Mount Wilson, where in the observatory there, Edwin Hubble came to realize that Andromeda was not a nebula in the Milky Way, but a galaxy, as they say, far, far away. That there were countless more of them and he began to calculate the vast expanse of the universe. The James Webb Space Telescope illustrates something important about how new discoveries are likely to occur in the future. It is an amazingly complex instrument that involves contributions from many different scientific fields and individuals, and it demands the ability to coordinate and integrate those contributions effectively in building a device that will allow us to explore the cosmos in ways we never have before. Isaac Newton is famously quoted as saying, if I have seen further than others, it is because I've stood on the shoulder, uh, shoulders of giants. And we remain fond of thinking about great discoveries being made by individual genius or by a relatively small lineage of gifted individual talents. But in the future, because of the breadth of research and the complex engineering required to make our new tools of exploration, what we build and discover will depend on a vast body of knowledge, on our collective contributions, and on the ability to coordinate and manage that knowledge. And that makes us realize that along with our curiosity, what is essential to future exploration is another defining characteristic of our species our extraordinary ability to cooperate with each other in order to reach shared goals. What we achieve in the future will depend not so much on individuals, but on a commitment to building a culture of scientific learning. The discoveries of the future will come from societies that broadly value that kind of learning and foster that kind of education. The project being discussed here tonight is only possible because of that. An enthusiasm for this kind of learning and wanting to share it with others it was, is what brings our presenter here tonight. Uh, Solomon Mara works as an engineer. He is the director of an engi in engineering and semiconductor startup company, and he's delivered many groundbreaking technologies and projects. His interests are signal processing, digital imaging, astronomy, and physics. He is an active member of the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassadors Program. He's going to talk to you tonight about the engineering of the James Webb Space Telescope and about what we hope to learn about the universe from it. Please join me in welcoming Salem Amara to the Burbank Public Library. Uh, thank Hobart for uh, this uh, nice introduction. So uh, actually, I, I, I'm so excited actually today to come and talk to you about uh, James Webb Space Telescope because uh, this program is actually, or like this project, 
It is one of those projects actually would make a difference in our understandings of our universe. This is actually, it's one of these huge projects that is equivalent, like one of the biggest projects actually NASA has is um, like, it's like uh, equivalent to basically the uh, large hydrogen colliders in, in Europe. Do you guys actually know this one? This basically like, uh, which basically was used to discover the um, um, uh, Higgs bosons. Okay, like uh, this big project actually in Europe, it costs like $10 billion. It's a bit mega colliders. So that's basically something like in this magnitude, it's huge, okay? And I'm gonna explain why it is huge and why, why we have to spend all this money in these efforts. Because actually almost we reached to the limits, actually what we can do from Earth and from space. And we need something to basically to continue our investigations. So basically this materials, all the materials I'm gonna to present today is just the public presentations. So some, some from, you can, you can find it from the web. So uh, this, uh, this image actually, it is uh, for the Hubble uh, Space Telescope. Everyone knows Hubble, correct? Good, so today actually, like uh, this year is 28 years. So Hubble's actually, it started uh, at, like launched in 1990s, okay? If you do remember, and it has some, some issues at the beginning, then basically it fixed and basically becomes the most amazing instrument, science instruments uh, NASA has. Um, it's almost like there is something like around, like from Hubble alone, there is something like around maybe, I don't know the n a number exactly, but actually this give or take, something like around 11,000 publications. Just to basically understand what publication means, it just is not a journal talk, it's just basically a finding or confirmation or so something like science basically model it, and this is basically confirmed. So that is actually 11,000 publications come out of, of Hubble over the years. That is actually an amazing number. So um, uh, it's this picture, actually, it is 2009 picture, and this is very emotional picture for me. And the reason is, this picture is taken from, uh, I think, actually Atlantis space shuttles. And after they fix the last mission for Hubble, and this is the last human being uh, look at Hubble, pretty much from Atlantis Space Shuttle. So after that, actually, no one basically gonna, so no, no man, human being is going to see uh, uh, Hubble except actually when it become like a, a fireball in the sky coming down. So expecting actually this Hubble actually will basically maybe live for another two three years, maybe more. Uh, it depends, but this means that is okay. We need to find like a successor for Hubble. This a very successful uh, uh, mission. Uh, or an instrument for science, we need to basically, what, okay, so the three years, if Hubble goes, what we're gonna basically do? What is, what is next? This image, this image basically is one of the most, I, feel like, uh, I think actually this is my opinion, uh, one of the most important images, okay, come from Hubble. And this come actually 2014. So this is 14 years after launching Hubble. And um, it's, if you look, actually, this is actually is not like, um, it's a composite image. And uh, if you understand what, how, how Hubble works, how Hubble actually rotates around the Earth, okay? So basically, like, it has an orbit around Earth. So typically, uh, Hubble rotates around, like, make one orbit in one and a half hours. So out of this one hour, maybe, uh, I don't, I don't recall the exact number, but maybe 40, 50 minutes actually, only basically can do, can look into the object, and, and after that basically, have, because I had to go to the other side, so it had to shut down. So basically, it is effectively, he can take 40 minutes of, of an image, and basically, it is basically takes so many orbits, okay, and uh, maybe like a four, in the range of hundreds of orbits, to take a picture like this. Okay, and it takes so many because, of course, like how, like if you take one and a half, one and a half hour per orbit, so basically maximum you can make per day maybe 15, 16 orbits. So if you want to make for 400, you need basically to lock into this object for almost like 11, 12 years, uh, uh, sorry, 11, 12 days, correct? So that's basically how, why it is so difficult to, to do a deep space. Uh, observer, observation using uh, Hubble telescope, right? Because he has to do this integration because you need to keep the shot, like you need to keep looking into this object for a long time. So, but actually, in matter of fact, if you look into, into this image, this is actually, you can see there is very small little red dots. And this basically we're gonna focus today, okay, on these red dots. 
in here, in this image, every point in this image is a galaxy by itself. Except actually there is one couple, or like a few local stars, like this big shiny ones. Those are actually a local star, like those are Milky Way stars, right? The rest, actually, each, each point in this image is almost a galaxy by itself. But you can think about it actually is, this actually is where we are today. This is actually is a time, okay? So this is actually time. time. So this is the story of our universe actually as we, as scientists actually, uh, tell, telling, telling it to us. So this something here actually is our Big Bang. This is the time zero, okay? So the time zero, there is something banged. We don't know what's banged, but something banged, okay? All the protons and helions, okay, uh, all the protons and neutrons get uh, uh, created, and also like all our heliums and hydrogens get created in this era, right? So, and, and after that, actually, this is what was very, was very warm, the universe actually was very warm. Then at reach at one point, it become, uh, it become basically cooled down to a degree that is okay, that is, the photons trapped in this era can be basically get released. So that's basically the only source of visible light in the universe will be what? Will be stars. There is no other source. You have to basically to, and what is, so basically they have to be basically a star to, uh, to produce a visible light. So what happened here? The light trapped inside this thing, actually after this it basically it cooled down because actually there's a light, there is basically there's a specific temperature can produce a visible light, and it cooled down, and immediately it cooled beyond the point which it can produce a visible light. So in here is a complete darkness. Imagine the whole universe is a complete dark. There is no source of light because we agreed just now that is the only source of light, visible light, in the universe is stars. So in here actually there is no stars at all. So this is actually we call it the dark age. And one of the most um, famous models, maybe actually you're gonna hear about it a lot, is called CDM, called dark matter. What this means, it says that is okay, there is no way actually you can create this universe, okay, except by a glob or like a, some, some collapse of dark matters, and this dark matters somehow, because actually interact with our matters only by, gra by gravity, it will collect some, um, some of the heliums, so this inflow of heliums going into this dark matter halos, and it's the, like this heliums actually will interact together and come close together and will create uh, hydrogen and heliums come together and create the early stars. So this is actually a theory. How we prove actually this theory, uh, of course, like the, how they do it, they come, someone will write a very good, nice theory, and we prove it and they come out actually with, they do it with simulations. But theory is a theory. Model is a model, okay, it's not a fact. So basically like, how we prove or disprove the theories are, of course like if you are a, a chemist, you go to the lab and you prove it or disprove it, okay, through experiment. But our experiments in astronomy, it is only by doing observations. We can basically refer to an age of the universe by age or by the redshifts, okay? And what is this redshift? So, so basically if the star, okay, is running away from you, pretty much actually you can stretch the wave coming from the, from the star or from this object, so it become it longer, and if it's become longer, it become more reddish. If it's coming towards to you, it become more bluish. So a redshift of one, this means that is okay, like almost the, wave, the waves coming from this object has been almost doubled. So a redshift of one is doubled, right? So if we say a redshift of 10, this basically become 11 time or like uh, almost 11 time uh, longer. Uh, Hubble discovered that it's okay, everything actually f like running away from us, okay, and he come out with these equations, okay, we, we have what's called the Hubble constants. So pretty much actually because actually the, the, the universe actually is expanding, right? So there's two facts here, that the universe expanding, okay, so the longer, like the far away the, the, the galaxies, the longer it is redshifted, right? Because it is expanding, so basically like it's going far away from us, 
not by speed, by in, like space, new space get created in, in the free space. That is basically the idea. So basically there is, a, like you can think about it actually, there is a new space get created every day. Okay, so let's go back to Hubble. So in, in like the ground-based telescopes can go only basically almost in redshift equal one, or basically equivalent to six billion years. So you remember actually we fixed Hubble, okay, and we did our first Hubble deep field, and we stopped at around uh, four, um, four uh, redshift of four. This is actually like the uh, Hubble ultra deep field. They the add an infrared capability to Hubble, so we will be, by doing this infrared, we will able to go to uh, redshift equal to ten. The next after Hubble, which can give us actually up to twenty, hopefully, maybe fifteen actually. And uh, so this is actually the bluish, okay, is the shorter wavelengths, the reddish is the longer wavelengths, okay. But the problem actually from Earth, the Earth basically has, of course, a half atmosphere, and the atmosphere has water, and it basically do a lot of absorptions of the infrared spectrum. So pretty much if an object, nearby object, okay, I can look into it, and I see these lines, okay, and I know basically by seeing these lines in the, in the visible lights and equivalent, like if I see this hydrogen lines, basically, for example, in, I know this is actually, there's no red shift. But if I see this hydrogen line moved away into the red, I know that is okay. It is almost, there is a red shift. This is an, an older, an older, an older star. So this is actually, is a technique we use to basically to, under, to see what is the redshift, correct? So you get an object, you look into it, and you look into these lines, and you see, okay, okay, this is actually our, my spectrum is shifted, okay, these lines are shifted, so I know that is, okay, what is, I can determine what, what is the redshift. When the, the universe started, actually, there is no hydrogen, no helium, no calcium, no oxygen, nothing, right? It's just hydrogen and helium. So how come, actually, we have, when we look in our sun, we have all these heavy elements actually get created. So this basically get created by all heavy elements, okay, get created up to iron, like it get created from fusions from a star. So the only way actually, unfortunately, the only way you can produce heavy, ele heavy elements than iron will be uh, supernovas. So this means, actually, that is our sun actually is not a first generation stars because it is heavy elements. Really, actually, if you look into the universe, the universe is hydrogen, helium, was almost 99% uh, hydrogen and helium. The, th the third, uh, the third uh, element is basically will be uh, oxygen. And a very interesting technique, we can determine the, 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 the age of this early star, okay? And how we do it, you remember actually I told you that is okay, there is unionized helium and, and hydrogens uh, was, was filling the, the, whole entire, uh, the whole entire universe. Then the first star basically start to lit up, start to start to basically produce light. So what will happen here, this hydrogen, it acts as a filter around those stars or intergalactic mediums, it acts as a filter. And pretty much actually it will remove all the blue from this, the light coming from, those, from this object. This is equivalent to basically if you have a, a lamp and you put a filter in front of, like a red filter for example. So what happened? So this filter will take all the lights and only basically let the red going through. Similar, basically, like this heliums in the intergalactic mediums, it will basically absorb all the blue spectrums from, this, from those stars, or from these galaxies. And we basically, like, the, like for example, actually, this, uh, like, um, this an, uh, 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 example, see, like, in the red, if you put a red filter, you're going to see it, okay? If you put a green filter, you're going to see it, but if you put a blue filter, you're not going to see it, okay? So you know that is okay. This is actually have the pattern of the first stars. So this is actually the way we see the first stars. 
So this is actually a, an actual data from Hubble, okay? So this is an object at redshift of three, okay? So basically, like I have one, two, three, four, like, uh, like I have a bunch of filters, five in the, in the optical domain, and there is a four in the infrared. And you can see, basically, I can see this object at redshift of three, I can see it in every, all the filters. I can almost see it in all the filters. So it basically like the whole entire visible light actually gets sucked in by this phenomena, and only like the galaxies actually get shifted to uh, to, the, to the galaxy is basically shifted to the infrared. So only the infrared filters can show the object. Uh, to determine the age of an, a galaxy, you have an object, and you can say basically by seeing these lines, I can basically determine the age, because I can see how this line gets shifted, correct? But for the early galaxies, early stars, it's very trickier, correct? Because we don't have the lines, because we don't have any metallizations, and the only way we can do is doing through these filters. So basically, if I wanna basically design something beyond Hubble, what I'm gonna do, I just, I need more infrared capabilities, I need basically, like, it has to be, uh, it has to be in space, we cannot do this from Earth. So of course, like I need more resolutions, okay? Than uh, than uh, than so, and I need more sensitivity. That's basically the criteria I need for for. Of course, like if we're gonna build um, such machine, maybe I can use it for some other stuff too. So I can basically we discussed in more in details how we're gonna do the uh, first first lights or first galaxies. But I can use also like because it is infrared, I can use it to do basically like. Um, how blends actually get formed, okay? And because actually, um, um, you know, dusts actually and planets, and um, it's it basically also like emit in infrared. Even we don't have to do, um, it doesn't have like, infrared could be basically like a, a dim elements can uh, produce an, an infrared. We in, emit infrared, like that's why thermal cameras and infrared cameras, you take picture for you, you can see it even you are in, in the dark. Also, like the big, big, bro, uh, big thing actually now, exoplanets. So there's up to maybe today, there's something like 3,800 new planets actually get discovered, and some of them actually they are in the habitable zone, which means that they are uh, having the in the same. It has the same criteria. Uh, like uh, some of those planets actually have the same criteria as Earth. So, so this is actually the four main themes actually for Hubble. Like the first lights, how the galaxy get evolved, the exo studying the exo uh, exoplanets, and, and also like how the stars, how what it triggers the stars to to start. So this actually would show you that is okay. This is actually a visible light image, and this is actually a near infrared, okay, and this is long infrared, like longer infrared, and you can see that is okay. More information, so I can even actually this is of course like not redshifted, like it's not a far one. This is one of very nearby galaxies. But by looking into galaxies with red uh, uh, infrared, I can see a little bit more details. So that's basically that is that's why we have this uh, uh, James Webb, and basically this will be successor to Hubble. And uh, of course, it has to be infrared, as I mentioned, because Hubble is stopped at one micron, or like 1.2 microns in infrared. Um, that is actually how, how what is the law, what is the length of the wavelength. So we need basically to build an infrared telescope. And if we want to build an infrared, we make it bigger. So this is actually six six and a half meter uh, across. So Hubble is 2.5 uh, 2.5 meter. So basically, Hubble is almost like one segment in this telescope. So this is basically, so of course, like we, it is, you notice actually it is gold because actually gold actually reflects infrared much better than any other materials. And so this basically can think about it. This is actually is the, the, the main mirror for the telescope. And beh behind it actually is the ISIM and which basically all the instruments, all the cameras, spectrographs, spect uh, spectrometers, okay basically lie behind here. And you notice there is something very interesting here, maybe I have a slide about it, it's the, the sun shield. And this is the spacecraft bus, which is uh, maneuver and communications and all this stuff. So this is another image, okay, for the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the mirror. 
And you can notice actually it is, um, this is actually in the Godard's actually, and uh, this is, you see this is the segmentation, so it's almost like a, in a complete state. Behind it, of course, like this is a segmented telescope, and behind each, to each of these segments, there is some actuator to basically you can move, so you can basically tune up uh, when you send these telescopes, so you need this. So in here, actually, they put the whole entire, the, the, the mirrors, the, the ISIM, and everything, they put it inside this chamber. So this is actually, it's called Chamber A in Johnson Space uh, in Texas. And they basically put the whole entire thing inside here, and they cool it down to the same temperature they can expose in, in space. So, and they tested, and the test result actually was almost like, a, was perfect. Uh, this actually another image. So basically, this is the mirrors. This is the ISIM from the back, and this is the sun shield, and this is actually the spacecraft. And so basically, in here we need to shield because this is an infrared. So we don't want to basically expose this telescope to the sun. So we have this huge, massive sun shield, okay, in in the back. And this is actually is uh, some solar panels, okay. And the solar uh, uh, the, the sun shield is five layers, and. Um, Maybe I have. So this actually how this how how uh, like this actually see, see this is another image. It shows that it's basically the telescope is pointing to the sky, okay, and this sun shield basically blocking the the sun from hitting the the scope. And the difference in temperature, believe it or not, between the back of the of the web and in the front, something in the, in the neighborhood of um, six like six hundred Fahrenheit. Or say 600 degree, or so basically, like in here, actually it is around minus 233 Celsius, or like minus 388. Imagine this, how, how cold this is. Of course, like this is actually like you just cross this boundary here, actually become uh, minus 388 Fahrenheit. In the other side, it's 185. So here, basically, you're gonna basically die from heat, and here you're gonna basically die from cold. You freeze. You freeze immediately. Freeze. So uh, pretty much, actually, like there is four main instruments. Okay, like there's a camera, infrared camera, and also like a spectrograph, mid infrared instruments, like a MIRI. We call it the MIRI. So this is actually these two cameras, and in, and here also like uh, 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 like another spectrographs and the camera. We call it fine uh, fine guidance sensors and infrared image and little spectrograph. It's just another spectro a spectrograph. This is actually how it looks like. It is basically the uh, uh, module. It is two by like it is. It's massive. It's a huge. And in here, basically shows that is how complex it is. So basically, some people say, okay, "Can we serve it?" There's no way you can serve this rocket here. Actually, like Hubble, they design it actually to be served. Uh, like it can be served. But this thing actually, it is very bad. The, the instruments in a very tough way. Um, maybe I can skip this one. But actually, like you remember, this is actually the camera. Uh, the main camera, which is basically uh, the subject of this, it just basically the light will come here and it goes through these filters. You remember actually the filters we talked about, okay, and how we do imaging in, so to detect the early, 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 um, um, early, early uh, galaxies uh, through these filters. So this is actually a wheel for the filters. And we can basically have two, uh, two, two almost like you can think about it, we have two cameras. Okay, for the mid inf like for the uh, mid infrared, so they split the beam into two different spectrums, and this is actually we have two cameras because this is the main, the main. So we have two identical cameras, and this is actually some of the sensors actually for the camera how it looks like. I don't want to basically go into details on this for now because I think we run out of time, and in here actually how far it is. So basically it is like hundred uh, million. Uh, miles from uh, uh, it is basically the L2 is with 1.5 uh, like uh, uh, 1 million mile from Earth. Hubble rotates every one and a half hour around Earth, so basically we have uh, most of the time actually we have to shut down Hubble, correct? So we don't want to basically do this in this scope and this telescope. So what will happen? We have to send it away into this area. Okay, we call it L2. It can stay in this area and basically follow the Earth. That is basically it's a huge telescope, correct? That is, this sun shield is basically 20 meter by four, almost 20 meter by 14 meter, okay? And this alone, this mirror is 16 meter. So there's no way we can basically put this in, in, a, in, a, in a rocket. 
So they're going to basically get launched by Ariane 5. So typically when they sp speak out uh, rockets, they basically mention the, 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 the diameter. So this is uh, uh, Ariane 5 means that it's, it can only take five meters worth of material. So we can basically, <coughs> once it fits, it basically gets launched by this um, European space, uh, like uh, by Ariane 5 in the French Guiana. Like, so it is not from US. So they have to take it all the way to um, South, uh, South America, pretty much. Thank you. What is the expected launch date? And once launched, how long is it expected to take until deployment at the L2 point? OK, so uh, the original launch date actually was planned for this year, October this year. But actually, uh, they have decided actually to do more testing. So uh, June next year is basically the, the next available time slot. And it, it almost like it took one month to basically arrive to L L2. And it takes around like maybe six months for commissioning to basically tune all the mirrors and the cameras and do calibrations and stuff like that. And that basically take another six months. So we expecting actually to get some results first light, they call it, from this like maybe mid 2000, uh, uh, end of 2019, early 2020. Yeah. What's the expected service life of this telescope? So typically for, uh, for, for Jeb's web it's five years. But actually the planning actually, the, she said okay, they have enough fuel to, uh, for the web to survive for 10 years. But five, minimum is five years. Could you talk about the fuel implications? What is the fuel going to be, uh, what are the energy requirements of this system and what is the so um, of course, like uh, electronics, it will get powered by electronics, and this uh, will be powered by solar. To f there's two, two two fuels actually in this. Um, one to basically maneuver the spacecraft, okay, and basically typically this is hydrogen, and there is another material, but I forgot the name. What happened actually is once you go to L2, it has it doesn't go to and stop here. What will go is basically do a circular round. It goes up and down in the space. So this basically like, it do a very, very complex maneuvers here. It keep doing rotations in L2. Goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And follow the Earth, like follow this L2 point. So, so it needs this fuel to basically do the maneuvers, the hydrogen, to basically do this um, maneuvers. And also like there's another fuel they need, which basically is to, um, uh, they have almost like a, a, a cooler to cool down the MIRI, which is a mid-infrared, remember? They have to cool it to a six, almost like a six, six degree Kelvin. In L2, the temperature is around, like remember actually uh, between, uh, b b uh, before the sun shield and after the sun shield. But for this MIRI, for this, uh, for, for this imager to work, um, it needs, they need to cool it down to 60 degrees, okay? And to do that, actually, they need to basically have the special machines to do that. Um, who is or was James Webb? Okay. So uh, James Webb actually is my favorite. <laughs> he's basically the uh, he's basically the head of NASA during the Apollo time, and uh, so basically it's, he's the one who's basically helped us actually to put the man on the moon. But I think actually he's uh, I think uh, he is also like switched NASA from being. Uh, you know, that is how this thing started. It started by basically like Cold War and we need to put men in a, uh, in a moon. But he want to basically also like switch NASA to become a science center. It's not basically, uh, you know, um, uh, like basically like it's not only like something like to prove actually we are better than anyone else. It's basically become a science hub pretty much. So I think actually this legacy. Yeah, he's... Um, um he wasn't a scientist, he was a businessman. He was like in the Truman administration. And it, uh, but they were looking for somebody who, who could organize and politically uh, put through the, uh, the programs that they wanted for space exploration. And he did, a, he did an amazing job. And, and as uh, Mr. Amara said, he, he pretty much built the, the program that, that landed a man on the moon. I think. Uh, uh, the moon landing was just a couple months after he retired from NASA. Yeah. 
Okay, since we're dealing with unvisible or invisible light to us, not visible light, because we like these pretty pictures, mm -hmm. uh, how is that going to be turned into something that we're going to be able to look at? So, okay, uh, that is actually, I can answer this question in, in one minute or can answer it in five hours, so uh, <laughs> it's up to you. I have actually an infrared camera. Maybe actually, if you guys are interested, I can show it to you actually how, how it looks like. Uh, maybe after the talk, it's more interesting. And uh, it's just basically map images into color. It just basically it's just a map. It, we don't have a notation of, 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 of uh, what is actually a, a colorful in infrared. It just typically people say, okay, uh, if it is uh, hot, basically we make it more reddish. If it is uh, colder, we make it more bluish. And this is basically actually how we map a, 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 a spectrum into into an, an, an image. And this is basically how it is. Hi, I was just curious. Does the U.S. own the scientific results from the telescope or? Is it shared with other countries? I love this question. Okay, <laughs> one of these good questions. So, uh, let us understand what's, what's going on with Hubble and this James Webb, and, in, and actually any NASA missions. Those actually are, you can think about it actually, all of them actually is like a public domain. You have access to this data. Whoever basically proposed something and get accepted, he has something like a, a exclusivity day, uh, data. Here actually in Hubble, they said, okay, you cannot basically hold uh, your results for more than one year. So basically the maximum, it can, you can hold your data and don't share it with anyone because you wanna basically be the first one to discover something, uh, is one year. Typically, typically, that is actually the rule in Hubble, but typically in US, most of the scientists, actually they release the data actually right away. Scientists, students across the world, across the world, not only the US, they apply for the time, and there's a committee to basically pick what is the best uh, obser observation point. And this releases data to the guy who basically, and the guy has the right to basically say, okay, release it to public or basically keep it. Typically they release it, why? Because actually they are ahead of any, any competition because they have the simulations, he has everything, actually it is in place. So he can basically go through the data much faster than anyone else because he's the one who's basically do the, uh, the proposal. James Webb actually will be the, exactly the same. But they have, I think actually 500 hours a year. So we hopefully like the first six months after the launch, uh, not, after the first light, which basically is like maybe a year, we can basically see a very nice data, maybe like mid to 2020, we're gonna see very nice uh, pictures from, uh, from, the, from the JEPS web. So is there anything else floating out there at L2 or will this be the farthest yeah. thing out? Good question. There is actually, um, um, there is so many <laughs> uh, missions actually was already in L2. So basically it's not new for NASA to basically to go to L2. For example, actually you remember actually the uh, 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 microwave backgrounds, uh, like Kobe's, uh, like this is a mission called Kobe, Planck Satellite, WMAPS, all this actually goes to L2s. And there is some Rubian, uh, Rubian actually uh, missions actually was in, in, in L2. So L2 is not new to NASA, basically. We go to, like they go to L2, uh, all that, like they go to L2 all the time. What facility had the prime contract and where was it tested? Uh, the main contractors for the whole thing actually is Northern Grumman, okay, for the bus, Sun Shields. And, uh, but actually like the, the Goddard, which NASA, is basically controlling all the other aspects, okay, for where every, like some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the instruments coming from Europe, but some of them actually coming from Canada, like the, the fine, uh, fine guidance system coming from Canada, the spectro, one of the spectrogram, actually, uh, spect, uh, uh, spectrometers actually coming from, uh, from Europe, but the rest actually is controlled where coming from and control, uh, 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 investigating the quality controls and testing and everything is basically done by Goddard, who is basically Goddard is NASA, pretty much in Maryland. So they basically pick all these instruments and they basically qualify it in Goddard, uh, 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 in Goddard. Plus, like, Northern Grumman is basically is a building, putting everything together. Where is it going to be launched? Kennedy? No, no. not no. Kennedy. Okay. Uh, it is, uh, uh, it's called French Guiana, so this is actually somewhere, it's actually, in uh, uh, no, no, in, uh, in South America. Yeah, yeah.
in the Atlantic, like, uh, north, like the south of the Caribbean Sea, some side of this area. And the reason actually to, they launched it from there because the, the rocket is French, right? So they basically... That was my question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the, the rocket actually, like, you know, actually in the old days, actually every country can pick whatever uh, um, uh, spot actually to launch their rockets. So um, um, we choose basically, like, uh, US actually choose Kennedy Space Center, uh, like, in, 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 uh, in Florida. Uh, you, you better actually, you, you, you launch from uh, closer to equators, it saves you a little bit of money, okay, compared to, to any other spots. Okay, Russians actually don't care, they basically launch from Siberia or something like, uh, you know. Uh, French actually, they, they will have some colonies in this area, so basically there's some, some islands in this area, so basically they will launch there so you can save a little bit of money. So, that, so they're going to fit it onto the rocket in French Guiana. In, uh, yes, so. Yeah, uh, and I want to I want to second what he said about the uh, video of seeing how it, it 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 is deployed from the rocket. It's pretty amazing, you know, uh, how this is all folded up in the rocket and how it, there's all these different stages to get it opened up to look like what you see in the drawing there. Um, any other questions, you guys? Um, is the James Webb Telescope going to work with the recently launched test to discover more about exoplanets? Absolutely. So basically, like now, actually, most of our uh, our uh, discovery for exoplanets is coming from Kepler and Kepler two. Kepler two is basically extension of the mission. So and now, actually, this is the successors. Okay. So this is would be more surveys. Of course, the data from these missions, okay, will basically be fed to, uh, to, to 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 Hubble. So it is basically you can think about Hubble is the finisher. It's just basically someone basically do the survey, do the job actually using some other instruments because this is a very, very, uh, 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 very expensive resources to basically ho like search, do surveys, for example, okay, using uh, using uh, uh, the web, right? So need someone to tell you, to, to tell you where to point this and get the data. That is basically. So of course, like we have to basically rely on uh, so many other missions and data from some other missions. Uh, how much does it cost? Oh, okay, so the whole, <laughs> the whole actually the whole thing actually like uh, as a budget actually it is uh, it is around eight billion dollar. Okay, I wanted I wanted to thank our guest tonight. You know, I wanted to point out he does this he does just because he loves to do it. He's he's come here on his own to talk to you, and so please give him a, a big round of applause. <laughs>